Our next presenter is going to be Emmett Tassin. Mr. Tassin is a natural resource specialist in the drinking water assessment team in the drinking water standards section. He has a, a degree in environmental studies from Southwest University. Emmett has been at the TCQ for two years and he conducts public water system compliance under the revised total coliform rule. So please welcome Emmett. Thank you so much. Um, as Catherine said, my name is Emmett, and I am with the RTCR team with the TCEQ, and I'm going to be covering coliform sampling and some of the modifications we've made to the microbial reporting form. Uh, brief overview of what we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to cover what do positive samples mean, how you can prepare for them, repeat sampling procedure, as well as public water system goals. Uh, around positive sampling, as I said, and also the changes we've recently made to the MRF. All right, so what do positives mean? Uh, essentially, when you get a total coliform positive sample, uh, it is an indication that there is a possible uh, contamination of the water. Uh, e. coli are a bit more of an acute public health uh, situation, but uh, with both of them, we want to make sure that we're taking those repeat samples right away to investigate what the problem might be. All right, so let's do a quick review of the different uh, total coliform positive sample types and what the requirements are for resampling on those. So anytime you get a routine sample that comes back total coliform positive, repeat sampling is required. And you'll collect those repeat samples within 24 hours from notica notification of the lab. Uh, repeats are a little different. Uh, if you collect under 40 samples a month and you get an additional positive with your repeat samples, an assessment will be triggered and no more repeat sampling will be required. However, if your system collects over 40 routine samples per month, you will go ahead and recollect a set of repeats at the same locations as that initial positive. Uh, for raw well samples, when those come back total coliform positive, there is no need to resample. Uh, same with special samples, with the caveat of uh, if you're using that sample for some sort of compliance, like a boil water notice or a seasonal startup, you will want to collect another special sample if that initial one does come back total coliform positive. Uh, with construction samples, uh, there is no uh, requirement to resample on those. However, we do recommend that you go ahead and do resample just to investigate what might have been causing that initial positive. But again, it is not required for construction samples. Uh, going over what is required after an E. coli positive, uh, addition, uh, like with total coliforms, if the routine comes back E. coli positive, you will need to collect another set of repeats as soon as possible. Uh, if one of your repeat samples from that initial E. coli positive come back positive for either total coliform or E. coli, no more resampling is necessary because an EMCL will be triggered and we would then contact you with follow-up information on uh, the procedures to follow that second positive. Uh, for raw, raw well samples, while there is no need to resample, the raw well team will reach out to you and follow up with additional information to, uh, to make sure you're following in compliance with their program. Uh, if, if you ever do receive a raw well total or E. coli positive, I highly suggest you reach out to the groundwater team. Their email is at the bottom of the slide there. They will definitely be helpful in walking you through those next steps. Uh, similar to the total coliform, a special sample comes back E. coli positive, and that's just your own special sample uh, for process control. While there's not a requirement to resample, we do recommend that you go ahead and do that just to investigate what might be causing that. Uh, and if you are using it to lift a boil water notice, you will have to resample on that. Uh, for construction, again, not required, but definitely recommended as a best practice for your system. All right, so after you drop your sample off and you're waiting for those, those results, uh, it would be the lab's responsibility to contact the public water system. Uh, that's why it's super important to have this part of the MRF filled out with your contact information, because we have to have some way to notify you of that positive so that you can go ahead and resample and stay in compliance. Uh, the lab will also notify us uh, when we're able to, and uh, you know, if we see that you're a smaller system that hasn't, have a, hasn't had a positive in a while, we'll reach out to you and provide you guidance as well. 
Uh, if you drop a sample off and you haven't heard anything from your lab in 24 to 48 hours, we definitely recommend following up with them just to make sure that those samples are negative. Uh, at the end of the day, it is the public water system responsibility to follow up and take action and make sure that you are available after dropping your samples off at the lab. All right, so what can we do to prepare for these positives? Top three things are gonna be prepare, organize, train. You wanna make sure that you have all of the documents uh, like your SOP and SSP up to date. That way you have everything laid out to you. There's no guesswork. You're just ready to roll if you get one of those positives. Uh, you wanna make sure that you're, you have the proper resources, uh, which we do have quite a few on our homepage. If you Google RTCR TCEQ, it'll pop right up with our homepage. We have a lot of resources on that page. Good, good to review those ahead of getting a positive. You also wanna make sure that you have a sample kit ready. Uh, this is an example of a checklist. You know, Definitely a good idea to just have a checklist like that on hand so you have everything you need to resample. You also wanna make sure that your operators on, are trained on proper sample collection protocol uh, and on completing the microbial reporting form. Uh, we get errors on microbial reporting forms pretty frequently and you know it can lead to a headache but if you are diligent about reviewing that MRF and knowing how to complete it it'll again save you a lot of trouble. For sample siting plans some of you I recognize your face from the workshop earlier on SSPs this is a document that required to have on site at the PWS uh, the reason we want to have these on site is it's going to lay out exactly your sample locations and what your upstream and downstream repeat locations are. Uh, you're going to want to avoid sampling at these locations because the intent of these samples is to represent the system as a whole. Uh, for, for example, entry points and storage tank will have a higher residual concentration due to the water being closest to the dis disinfection facility while dead ends and unoccupied houses may have a lower residual concentration due to being further away and stagnant water age. Uh, for groundwater systems, we recommend that if you own a lot of wells, that you develop a triggered source monitoring plan, uh, TSMP will, was what you'll commonly hear it referred to. Uh, this plan will help you when triggered source monitoring samples are required to be collected by determining which wells should be sampled depending on the location of the routine distribution sample. Um, we do have a TSMP workshop uh, that will be available online, so if you weren't able to catch that, you can always catch that uh, through the uh, recorded uh, presentations online after, the, after this uh, workshop. Sample collection SOPs. So these are the elements that should be included in your SOP. I will say this link here does bring you right to our example SOP. You can go ahead and use that example SOP, put your system's information on there, and it will definitely do a good job of walking you through proper sampling procedures and repeat sampling procedures. Uh, and that is available on our website. And again, you can definitely feel free to use that as your system's SOP. Best practices for sample collection, you wanna know your licensing requirements. For example, community systems and non-transient non-community systems do require a licensed operator, and you wanna make sure that you have your licensing information up to date. You also wanna make sure that any personnel out in the field is trained on proper sampling procedures, and plan accordingly to the sample schedule. I'll go into a little more detail with this on the next slide, but the day of the week and the time of the month is super important when sampling to consider. You also wanna know your lab's hours and weekend availability, and always have a backup lab just in case your lab is having an issue, they might be closed for whatever reason, you wanna know another place where you can take those samples. All right, so going back to the importance of the day of the week and the time of the month, so, we get this a lot, where we'll get a positive sample on a Friday afternoon, the sampler calls back, says my lab is closed, what am I supposed to do? So, you can avoid that problem entirely by sampling on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, just earlier in the week that gives you more time. You know, you can see by this flow chart, if you're having a positive on a Friday, you will have to recollect your samples on a Saturday and find a lab that will accept them. A lot of labs aren't open on the weekends, and if they are open, they do charge more for 
receiving samples and processing samples. So it's definitely to your advantage to go ahead and just sample earlier in the week. Uh, as far as the time of the month, so if you're waiting till the very last day of the month to take your sample, a storm hits on that day, you miss your sampling, you will unfortunately be issued a monitoring violation. Uh, so that's why if you know planning to sample in the first or even in the first week of the month, storm hits, you're not able to get there, you still have plenty of time left in that monitoring period to go ahead and collect that sample. So, uh, you know, big, a good example of this is the big freeze that happened right at the end of January last year. A lot of people missed their samples because they were waiting till that last week of the month. Storm hit, they weren't able to collect their sample. So, you know, that can be easily avoided by just go ahead and doing that earlier in the month. When selecting a lab, you want to make sure that you're using an accredited lab. You can find a map, uh, this map here, on our website, the RTCR webpage, or the PWSSP webpage. Uh, you can easily find an accredited lab in their hours uh, using this. Definitely a great resource, uh, especially if you have your primary lab, you don't know what you might pick for a backup lab. Go ahead and look on this map and you can easily find something close to you. Uh, you wanna make sure you're keeping in mind those lab's hours and their fees as well. As I mentioned, often there is an added fee for the weekend sampling. Uh, and it's definitely a good idea to build a rapport with your lab. Uh, that way, they're familiar with your sampling when they're reviewing your MRF at drop-off. They know what they should be expecting to see. Uh, you know, it's just a great relationship to foster with your lab. All right, so for collection supplies, uh, your lab is gonna be the one to provide you your microbial reporting form, as well as your sample bottles. Uh, you will only be using the supplies provided by your lab. Uh, and if you have a backup lab, make sure you're also grabbing supplies from them as well to have on hand, just in case you're needing to use them, you're not having to run to the lab, collect those supplies, go back to sample. Uh, definitely can save you some, some time and money looking ahead and making sure you have both your primary and backup lab supplies on hand. Uh, you wanna make sure that you're checking those sample bottles, that they're not damaged or expired, and that way, once you get to the lab, you drop off your sample, and then it's rejected because it's damaged or expired. Go ahead and be ahead of the curve on that. Couple examples of some MRFs we've seen. Uh, as you can tell, it's a little hard to make out. Kind of a mixture of cursive and writing, and it generally looks like it was a rush job. You know, when that happens, it's, we're gonna have to reach out to you and verify information, and it leads to a bunch of other steps. As opposed to this bottom example, as you can see, Super easy to read. Uh, even the one that's using capital and lowercase level letters, you can tell they weren't rushed when they were writing that. Very clear. Uh, you wanna make sure that the information, contact information, as I mentioned earlier, is up to date. Can't tell you how many times we've tried to reach out to a system that's gotten a positive and either the number is uh, disconnected or leads to a super large phone tree that's hard to find exactly who's responsible. Uh, definitely helpful to have a direct line to someone who uh, knows what to do when these positives are reported. You also wanna make sure that you're reading over your MRF before you're dropping it at the lab. Uh, so a lot of people use pre-filled MRF forms. You wanna be double sure when you're using those forms to look over it. We have systems who use these forms who grab the wrong one, take it to a system, and then once the PWS ID and name don't match the sample, Fortunately, we can't accept that for that system. So you wanna make sure that you're always reporting the correct PWS ID and PWS name on that MRF, and that the sample locations you've chosen to sample from are reflected on your SSP. You also wanna make sure that you're filling in the uh, field measurements, the chlorine residual. I'll go over this a little bit with our new MRF, but while we're still cycling out these old MRF uh, formats, you do have to circle the free or total chlorine can be such a simple thing to leave off, but uh, could lead to sample rejection down the line if you're not completely filling in the chlorine residual. All right, and of course, the best way to avoid all of these headaches is to avoid getting a positive. Often easier said than done, obviously. Always a good thing to uh, keep your system in top-notch condition. If you notice a repair that needs to be done, go ahead and take care of that as soon as possible. Uh, you never know what could lead to these positives. Make sure you're following your flushing schedule as well. Uh, that way your lines aren't sitting stagnant where there might be dead ends. You also wanna make sure to follow your SOPs and SSPs. 
Uh, even if you think you've done it before, done it a bunch of times, the SOPs can definitely help lead to uh, keeping on top of those little errors that can occur from time to time. Most importantly, take your time, don't rush. Uh, that's often, I would say, 90% of the mistakes we deal with is because samplers are uh, you know, in a rush because as we all know, it's, there's shortages of samplers out there. I know y'all are working hard out there, but with these MRFs, it really does cut down on the work long term when you're making sure to take your time with those. All right, so repeat sampling. As I mentioned before, the purpose of repeat sampling is to investigate potential contamination or to identify actual contamination. Uh, it could also lead to uncovering improper sampling technique. Um, you know, that it does happen where people forget to uh, disinfect the tap or, you know, silly things like that. And, you know, just a good reminder to go ahead and follow through on all the proper sampling techniques. So you do have 24 hours from lab notification to go ahead and collect those repeat samples. And you will be collecting one repeat sample at the original source of the positive, one upstream and one downstream, both within five service connections of that original positive. When filling out the MRF for these, you're gonna mark those samples as repeat on the MRF. Um, special samples and construction samples don't count towards routine compliance. So if you were to mark the samples as those sample types, we would not be able to count those samples as repeats. So just make sure you're marking those samples correctly. And uh, also there is a field to mark the original positive sample ID and date of collection. Uh, that is very important with making sure we're linking those repeats to the original positive and avoiding any uh, violations that were issued by error just because of documentation. Uh, you can always check that information, the original positive ID and date of collection on Drinking Water Watch. You would just type in your system's PWS ID. It would pop up with your sampling history for the past two years. You can find the date of collection and lab ID on the Drinking Water Watch website. Uh, there are some public water systems out there that don't have upstream and downstream locations. Uh, if you're one of those systems, you can definitely reach out to us for guidance. Uh, in general though, if you have only upstream locations from that point, you would just take from the two closest upstream, same with downstream. Uh, if you only have downstream locations, you would just collect from the two closest downstream locations. Uh, and if you only have one source to collect from, you would just collect three samples from that one source five minutes apart. Uh, again, I know that's a lot of information to remember, so always feel free to reach out to us and to get guidance on that if you're one of those systems. Triggered source monitoring requirements are uh, for groundwater systems that have active wells. Uh, after a positive is collected, you do also have to collect a raw well sample from any well that was active at the time that positive was collected. Uh, there are some systems that might have a well offline or in an active well. Definitely reach out to the groundwater team if that's the case, and they will provide guidance for you on your sampling requirements. Uh, oh, and a good thing to emphasize and a uh, common thing we'll see happen is, uh, for instance, if you get two positive samples and you have two wells, that means you're going to be getting four raw well samples. For each positive, you have to grab a raw well from all active wells. So just make sure you're collecting the right amount of raw well samples given your number of positives. Uh, when you're going out to collect these repeats, make sure that you're uh, following your SOP. I know that's uh, redundant, but we can't say it enough how that can lead to uh, avoiding these simple little mistakes like uh, you know, just forgetting to do one step that could cause these positives. Uh, and making sure that you're using that MRF from the accredited lab. Uh, just touching on how to complete the MRF, and actually this is the, uh, the newest version of the MRF for those who haven't gotten a look at it. Labs are gonna have some time to cycle through the old ones, but uh, pretty soon here you'll be seeing something similar to this from your lab. Uh, and you can see that big bold line down the middle towards the left and the bottom is gonna be our concern uh, for the samplers. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that your PWS ID information is uh, fully filled out and correct, uh, as well as your own information as the sampler. Uh, you wanna make sure that you're marking that sample type correctly 
and that you are putting in the location based off of your SSP. And here's a little bit of a closer look of what that uh, looks like when you're marking these samples as repeat. You're marking your upstream, original, and downstream. Well, that's not required to make that notation. It is helpful to see. Uh, and your raw wells are always going to be marked as raw well. Uh, and for those locations, you want to make sure that you're putting the uh, well ID number and not just well one, well two. Uh, you do need to put the full well ID. Uh, you can, again, find that information on Drinking Water Watch if you don't have that handy. And yes, if it is a uh, repeat location, like a repeat samples like these, you can see on the far right there that the original sample ID and date of collection are filled out there. That's going to help us avoid any documentation issues. Again, always double check. Even when you think you got it, just take one more look before dropping it down at the lab because corrections are limited. And we don't want you to miss credit for that sample just because of a small mistake. We do have a rule that it was implemented that uh, samplers can only make one correction per field per year. So if you mess up your PWS ID, then the next month you make that same mistake. Unfortunately, we're not able to make that correction. So that's why it's so important that you're double checking these. And um, we have had some, some recent cases of uh, falsifying information on microbial reporting forms. Uh, this is a pretty big offense. So it ain't worth it to, to falsify that information on the MRF. Make sure that everything is up to snuff there. So some of the most common errors we'll see are the ones list, listed here, especially the, the sample type. I feel like that's a pretty big one on repeat samples. Uh, just make sure you're always checking this information that it is accurate. For rejected samples, this can be a little tricky for systems. If you drop your repeats off, they're rejected for whatever reason. Uh, the lab does have 24 hours to notify you of that rejection. And then at that point, you would go out and recollect at the same point that that rejection uh, occurred. And you would mark that as both repeat and replacement on that MRF. So just make sure you're fully documenting all of this. It makes it a lot easier to follow the paper trail and make sure that all of your uh, resampling requirements were met. Good point here is to include the rejected repeat information. The previous sample would have had your original positive ID but because this is replacing that other uh, repeat sample, that's the one you're gonna link it to. What happens after you get your results? Uh, so the lab will notify you of those repeat results. If they come back negative, you are good to go. No more action is required. You continue sampling under your, uh, your sample schedule the following uh, month. Uh, if there is a positive, you may need additional repeats uh, if a assessment was not triggered uh, and if it is an EMCL uh, triggered, then you will need to issue a boil water notice. So keep that in mind if you ever do get an E. coli positive sample that uh, it is possible you will have to issue a boil water notice. We will definitely be reaching out to you to provide uh, specific guidance on that. Just a little visual for systems that have fewer than 40 samples per month. Uh, if you get that, uh, if you collect that one set of repeats, Within 24 hours from uh, site A, you're going to be, and you get all uh, negatives, you're all good. But if you do get positives, then that is when the assessment is triggered and no more repeat sampling is required. For 40 or more, you're going to be collecting those repeat samples at those original sites until uh, either all, the whole set comes back negative or an assessment is triggered. Uh, and again, we will reach out to you when these assessments are triggered, or you can always check Drinking Water Watch to verify how many samples you collect a month and how many positive samples have been associated with your system in that monitoring period. But, uh, you know, we will definitely be keeping track of that. So you can always check in with us. The goal of these assessments that are triggered is to try to help find and fix any sanitary defects that might be causing these positives. You do have 30 days to complete these. Uh, they're essentially a checklist that you'll fill out to check your system. There's also a little place where you can write maybe what you thought might be causing it to give us any background information. 
We always try to review these as quickly as we can when we get them back. Uh, but we also might be reaching out to you for even more clarifying questions. But uh, just make sure to be keeping an eye out for any communications by the TCEQ after these, are, after these assessments are triggered. L2A assessments are triggered when you've already had an L1A assessment triggered in the past rolling year. Yeah, if you get two assessments triggered in a year, that's what's going to cause the L2As. And again, the goal of these is to help find and fix anything that might be causing these positives. As I've said, the TCEQ will reach out to you when these are triggered. We're going to get your contact information so that we can email over all of the information associated with these assessments. Uh, again, another huge reason it's important to make sure your contact information is up to date with the TCEQ. So the information that we'll be sending you, the assessment trigger information, the form, the due date, and a few other resources, uh, just want to make sure that you have everything you need to complete these assessments completely. Uh, for the EMCLs, these are an acute health hazard. So uh, if any of you have ever gotten an E. coli positive, you probably know we're pretty quick on the draw to give systems calls and provide guidance on these uh, because they definitely might indicate a sanitary defect. So uh, this is another one of these charts that kind of breaks down what is required. Uh, so for your, if you do get an E. coli positive, the repeat comes back either total coliform or E. coli positive, the EMCL is triggered. Uh, and vice versa, if you get a total coliform and then an E. coli positive, unfortunately that triggers an EMCL. Uh, if you don't collect your repeats after an initial E. coli positive, that will also trigger. So you want to make sure that you are collecting those samples as quickly as positive. Uh, if you're just getting a total coliform positive, one of your repeats is total coliform positive, that does not trigger an EMCL. Uh, e. coli is really the, um, the root of the EMCL triggers. When those EMCLs are triggered, you want to make sure to notify the TCEQ if we haven't reached out to you already and to post a boil water notice within 24 hours. Uh, the guidance for this will be included in the email we send you, but you do want to send that notice to the boil water notice team and the certificate of delivery uh, as soon as you can. In order to rescind those boil water notices, you do have to collect a set of special samples that come back negative. Uh, if they come back positive, you have to continue to resample until they do come back negative in order to rescind that boil water notice. An L, or I'm sorry, a violation type 1A is also going to be triggered as well as a level two assessment. All right, some goals for public water systems. Uh, it really is just to stay prepared and be ahead of the curve. Uh, when you drop off a sample, make sure you're not dropping it off and then going on vacation the next day and not available to resample. Or if you are, have a backup plan so that someone can go out there for you. Uh, you want to have a backup lab in case there's an issue with your lab and sample acceptance. You're always following your SSP and SOP for sampling, and you're making sure you have extra kits on site for resampling. Uh, you also want to make sure that your timing is uh, to your benefit of your sampling, sampling early in the week and early in the month. You're verifying all of the information you've recorded, and you're following through with your results if, uh, you know, labs like all of us can make mistakes as well. If they haven't reached out to you, always feel free to reach out to them just to verify that your results are indeed negative. You want to make sure you're maintaining your records for the past five years. And if you ever need any assistance, please don't hesitate in reaching out to our team. All right, so just going over a few of the modifications that have been recently made to the microbial reporting form. As you can see, the chain of custody section has been moved to the bottom. It used to be at the top right. Uh, gives people a little more room there to uh, write their full names in legibly. Uh, so always make sure you're double checking that section at the bottom now. Uh, there's also the option to digitally enter information into these MRFs. Uh, always make sure you're, again, getting your MRFs from your labs. They can provide you specific guidance on what, the, what they're using. Uh, we will be moving to exclusively military time, uh, as well as splitting up those free and total residual boxes. Uh, this is to avoid having to circle the little a m p m or the little f or the little t. Uh, makes it a little more clear and less error prone. Uh, we're also updating our laboratory positive reporting form and the instructions for completing the MRF. 
Uh, while those haven't changed, I don't believe they are just uh, put into the same document as the lab instructions as well. And you can see all of these forms if you're interested at the PWSSP page. Uh, the web link is down there below. All right, and if anyone has any questions, I am happy to answer them. You can also feel free to take down my information. If you think of something down the line, give me a call or send me an email, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. I have a question. Yes. Uh, this is from a virtual participant. And the question is, is there a minimum number of sample sites required for routine sampling? If you're required to collect 70, I'm not sure what that is, per month, do you need uh, 70 sample sites? There's no required number, but you do want to make sure that the sample sites you choose are representative of the water flowing through the system. So if all of your sites, if you're a city and all your sites are on one side of town, that's not going to be representative of the water as it flows through the system. So just make sure your sites are representative of how the water is flowing. Okay. Uh, you know, you just take one sample a month mm -hmm. and you get a bad sample. You have to take the repeat from the same spot. You have to take a raw well sample mm -hmm. and then one upstream and one downstream. Exactly. So that's four samples. Exactly. Okay. Yes, and you know, if you had two wells, then that would be five samples and so on and so forth. But yeah, it is the three repeat and then one raw well from any active well at the time that positive was collected. It's me again. <laughs> I, I, this is Greek to me because water is not my thing. But uh, the question is, what are the EMCL requirements for the PWS water hauler? Um, for the for the water hauler, it will be the same as uh, regular public water systems. The 1A violation will be issued, and an L2A assessment will be uh, required. Uh, you do have 30 days to complete those. Uh, you would have to issue a boil water notice uh, and, you know, make sure to collect those special samples in order to rescind that notice. Okay, here's a softer one. <laughs> <laughs> what is the date of the new form? Uh, what is the date that the new form is required? Um, so the labs are going to have six months. I, February 1st, I believe, is the date, 2024, that labs have to conform to those new forms. Uh, so you'll see that slowly cycle out over the next few months here, but the, the last date is going to be in February 1st for those labs to get that new form. For a non-community, non-transient PWS, what determines upstream, downstream, and uh, we do have five buildings on the site. Um, so like it's same with any public water system. It is just the, the service connections that are upstream and downstream from the sampling point. Uh, there should be listed on the system's SSP outlining what the sampling points are uh, in the upstream and downstream, but it's just how the water flows, the sampling points that are upstream from that original source and downstream. Uh, probably everybody knows my question, <laughs> but uh, where do you get the testing kits? Because I just purchased a motel and I don't have no idea what the testing uh, kits. The testing kits for the chlorine residual, yes. um, uh, you know, I believe you, you can get those online. Just make sure that they are the approved testing kits for the residual, but you can buy those online. Uh, the sample bottles, you want to make sure those are from the lab. Is it have to be approved by TCQ or is it just any testing kit? <laughs> this is Claire Carlton, my uh, team lead. So you just want to make sure that um, whatever you buy has a method that's approved by TCEQ. So um, I think that some of the main ones that people use are like a Hawk um, colorimeter or there's like Lamont, I think is another brand. So if you need assistance on finding one that's suitable, um, you can reach out to us. You can reach out to Emmett um, or to our main uh, email box at tcrdata.tcq.texas.gov and we can provide you resources on where to find those. Um, so that's the main thing is you just want to make sure that the method that it's used for that equipment is uh, an acceptable method. Um, and I guess another thing for you too, since you're new, um, any sample bottles that you will use to take samples with, they need to come from your laboratory. You can't like 
use a mason jar and fill it up and then take it to the lab and have that sample analyzed. It needs to, um, those sample bottles need to come from your laboratory. I had a question about the, uh, this, this new um, MRF form that, that's yeah. rolling out. I know that it had, um, I guess I work for Austin Water. Yes. And in our case, um, we, the, the people that work in the laboratory collect the sample. Mm. And so like some of this infor other information like the, 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 the courier mm -hmm. and uh, like the phone, like how much latitude is given to this, to this form for modification? Do we just? So um, we will allow modifications to the form. Um, I uh, caveat that with that um, they have to be approved by us. Um, so we will work with laboratories um, to kind of go through the modification uh, process. So they will submit that modification to us. We will review it and then provide official approval. Um, that's happening now. I think we already have received y'all's modification request. Um, but so, um, yeah, so I understand the ad that y'all don't have, usually have a career and you're kind of doing all of your own sampling. Um, that's not a huge issue uh, there to remove that career requirement. Um, what we don't want to get into and what we're trying to uh, avoid with modifications is taking out um, kind of the sample collection and analysis portion of that form. Um, you know, we have close to 7,000 systems in the state of Texas, 1,100 laboratories, and we receive a lot of different stuff. And so just trying to kind of um, minimize variations of results and things like that. So. We're evaluating our sample sites, and so we have some really good locations, um, but maybe the downstream is a little questionable. So maybe it's quarter of a mile, maybe it's half a mile. What kind of is the feeling on that? Because we've shied away from doing that in the past, so just ask him. Shied away from using that sample yeah. site, basically. Yeah, because the downstream is so far away. Absolutely. You know, if you have the option to avoid it, if that is an option, I, you know, it's not a bad idea to choose a different sample site that is a little more representative of how those repeat samples will come out. Uh, you know, it is, it, it's not, as long as you're within that five service connections, we would never not allow you to use that site. But if you have concerns over it, then, you know, it might be wise to choose a different site. I don't know if Claire might have a, some wisdom for that as well. I guess I'd just say it's it's up to you. Um, I get what you're saying. Um, if you can avoid it, if you can find another area of your distribution that has a site that's closer, I think that's a great thing to do. Sometimes I know for some of y'all, or you uh, provide water to very rural areas, and so they're not going to have. I mean, you go miles, and there's no no, no next connection. Um, so. The main thing is that you want to still make sure that the sample locations are representative of water um, in your distribution. And if you have that, um, I would say just be cautious if you want to totally take it out because you just want to make sure that you're documenting, um, you know, you're not leaving out entire sections of your distribution because that next connection is way down the line. Well, I appreciate all y'all's time today and definitely feel free to reach out if anything pops into your head down the line. Uh, we are definitely open to, to giving as much helpful advice as we can. Yes. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much.